This is Peter Hughes of Financial Intergroup and welcome to this BCBS 239 tutorial. Today I'm going to demonstrate how risk accounting can solve some of the issues relating to the implementation of the Basel Committee's Effective Principles for Risk Data Aggregation and Risk Reporting, otherwise known as BCBS 239. We're specifically going to focus on these elements of BCBS 239. We could collectively refer to them as risk data controls. They address aspects such as the reconciliation and validation of risk data, the introduction of accounting-like control over risk data, and the need for timeliness in risk reporting. So let's start with the blindingly obvious. We need two things if we are going to aggregate risk data effectively. The first is standardized identification systems, that is, the systems of coding we use to uniquely identify data. If we want to aggregate data that spread across multiple systems in multiple locations by, for example, legal entity, we need to tag standardized legal entity identifiers or LEIs onto each item of data so computers know which hierarchical aggregation paths the data should follow. The second is a standardized risk exposure quantification method. We can't validly consolidate and aggregate data if the quantitative values assigned to them are produced by different measurement methods. For example, miles and kilometers measure the same thing, distance, but we can't aggregate miles and kilometers and expect to get a meaningful result. So my key question for this tutorial is, in the absence of a standardized and universally accepted method of calculating exposure to risk, are BCBS 239's accuracy, integrity and timeliness requirements achievable? And here we have the problem. On this slide we've listed a selection of methods used by risk managers and accountants to identify, quantify and report exposure to risk. Each one of these methods produces outputs that could loosely be termed risk data. All of these methods are vital for ensuring that risks are properly managed at the granular level. But again, at the risk of stating the blindingly obvious, we can't aggregate them by simply adding them together because the methods used to produce the outputs are all different. We have a particular issue with RAG assessments in the left column. Here we identify risk and assess the likely impact by using a system of three colours, red, amber and green. Unfortunately, we can't consolidate and aggregate colours and yet this is the technique that is universally used by financial firms to manage their operational risks. So is BCBS 239 dead in the water? It possibly is unless we can think of something new. Let's start by looking at the problem from an accounting perspective. Accounting involves the registration of all transactions upon their approval in accounting systems. Upon registration, each transaction is tagged with codes that are used by computers to ensure it follows its correct aggregation paths. From the codes tagged onto transactions, they can be aggregated to give us, for example, business line profitability, customer profitability, product profitability, legal entity profitability, geographic profitability, and so on. We also capture transaction values on registration, which can be, for example, historic cost, no notional value or mark-to-market values, and there may be other values. That means that every time we take a different cut of accounting data, for example, to construct product profitability, we can use aggregated transaction values as population controls to tell us whether the data we have used is complete and accurate. Almost by instinct, accountants embed controls totals based on transaction values throughout their reporting processes to ensure they are complete and accurate and all accounting data is generally tied back to its source, which is the general ledger. When thinking about risk data aggregation in the accounting context, we started to think whether we could tag a new transaction value onto each transaction, its exposure to risk. We asked ourselves this question, which is at the bottom of the slide. If we could tag transactions with risk codes that can be used in a standardized calculation of each transaction's exposure to risk, would that begin to solve our risk data reconciliation and data integrity problem? If that were possible, we could call the method risk accounting. It's now that we need to engage in some revolutionary out-of-the-box thinking. 
The first point is that any universal measurement system needs a common standardized unit of measurement. A natural currency is not a good standard unit of measurement for risk quantification and reporting for the reasons shown on this slide. Firstly, there are many currencies and their values relative to each other are constantly changing. Secondly, the quantification of exposures to financial risks in monetary terms typically involves the application of stochastic techniques that are difficult to standardize, are invariably complex and inherently lagging. And perhaps most significantly, exposures to non-financial risks, for example operational risk, cannot be validly expressed in monetary terms. We concluded that the answer was to create a new metric, a common standardized unit of risk measurement we call the risk unit or RU. If we can accept that, life in the world of risk reporting starts to become a lot easier. Our proposition is that financial firms can validly report the risks they accept absolutely and in comparison to others by using our new risk metric, the risk unit or RU. The adoption of a new risk metric for risk reporting, the risk unit, will challenge the senses of many of us. But any new measurement system and common unit of measurement will evolve through its active use from an abstraction to something that is universally and intuitively understood. For example, we intuitively understand that a AAA credit is a high quality credit, or a body temperature of 100 degree, 1 degrees Fahrenheit, 38.3 degrees centigrade, means a person is unwell, and 26 miles or 42 kilometers is a long way to run. So how do we calculate the RU's transaction by transaction? In this tutorial, we hope to at least give you a sense of how risk accounting method works, but we have other more detailed resources and worked examples available in the form of research working papers that are in the public domain. We'll provide details of where you can obtain these at the end of the session. But in summary, we start with the transaction's value and map it to something called a value table, where we look up the applicable value band weighting and assign it to the transaction. We'll come back later to discuss the value table in more detail. We then determine what risks are triggered by the transaction and go to the relevant product risk lookup tables where we ascertain the applicable product risk weightings and assign them to each transaction. For example, credit, credit product risk weightings are based on expert assessments made of the underlying collateral by reference to its value retention properties and the degree of anticipated difficulty in arriving at a liquidation price upon disposal. This product by product risk assessment is then scaled to a weighting of between 1 and 20. Each transaction's inherent risk in RUs is then arrived at by multiplying the value band weighting by the product risk weightings. We then calculate the risk mitigation index or RMI for each transaction. The basis for the calculation is best practice scoring templates. For each of the categories shown here under processing risks, we have reference data, operations and core systems, and then credit, market and liquidity risks. Experts have identified, weighted and scaled to a range of between 0 and 100 the best practices and best practice benchmarks that affect risk mitigation. So an RMI of 100 means that risk mitigation is perfect and the inherent risk of a transaction is mitigated to zero. But don't worry, an RMI of 100 never occurs. There is always some residual risk. And then we calculate the residual risk in RUs, which is the inherent risk reduced by the RMI as a percentage. I'll leave this slide here for a few seconds so that you can take a look. Here is an interpretation of risk accounting's three core metrics. Inherent risk in RUs is representative of the transaction's maximum potential for loss. The risk mitigation index is a measure of the effectiveness of the enterprise in mitigating inherent risk through the effective management and control of the firm's operating environment. And residual risk in RUs is representative of the probability of unexpected loss being the portion of the inherent risk not covered by effective risk mitigation. So quite simply, if the risk mitigation index is low, the probability of unexpected loss is high. Or said another way, if the credit risk mitigation index is low, 
there's a high probability that loans have been approved that shouldn't have been approved. Or if the market risk mitigation index is low, there's a high probability that traders are operating unauthorized positions and so on. The longer term view is that the RMI will ultimately become a primary determinant of risk culture. I mentioned that we would take a closer look at the value table, so here it is. As you can see, the logarithmic curve on the chart starts steeply and progressively flattens as transaction processing volumes and values increase. The curve is intended to reflect the natural increase in operating sophistication that occurs as transaction volumes and values increase, primarily through enhanced automation. The application of the value table effectively scales the transaction values to the size of an enterprise and facilitates the benchmarking of operating environments within and between enterprises. As we previously commented, the adoption of a new risk metric for risk reporting, the risk unit, will challenge the senses of many of us. One aspect that will perhaps enhance the RU's attractiveness is the prospect that through the statistical correlation of exposures to risk in RUs and actual loss history, we should be able to derive the monetary value of an RU over time. This opens up many other possibilities for risk reporting in the future. Some of them we'll discuss on the next slides. Here are some BCBS 239 criteria with an explanation of how risk accounting would handle them. This is on this and the next two slides. So starting with risk data controls, these can be created by permanently tagging transactions with their exposure to risk in RUs, which enables population controls to be used to reconcile risk reports. Reconciling risk data to accounting data. The source of data for risk accounting is the general ledger, and it runs in parallel with management accounting, so risk data is directly tied to accounting data. Build to a single authoritative source for risk data. Our proposition is that the risk accounting system, as an extension of the general ledger and management accounting system, will become the single authoritative source of risk data. All risk reports will be reconcilable to that source. Moving on to risk reporting requirements, capital adequacy. We believe that it is theoretically possible to use the risk accounting method to restate a firm's balance sheet in RUs to produce a risk balance sheet. As we discussed in an earlier slide, it should be possible over time to derive the monetary value of an RU. That being the case, the opportunity exists to use risk balance sheets in RUs as a basis for determining capital adequacy. Regulatory capital. Using the same thinking we use for capital adequacy, risk accounting also creates the opportunity for regulators to use RUs in the determination of regulatory capital requirements. Capital and liquidity ratios. Risk accounting enables the explicit and dynamic calculation of exposure to risk using our standardized risk metric, the RU, that can be used to provide more relevant risk-based calculations of capital and liquidity ratios. Credit, market, operational and liquidity risk. The explicit and dynamic calculation of exposures to these risks is a natural output of the risk accounting method. Moving on to stress testing. If we approach stress testing with the additional and more comprehensive and representative risk information provided by risk accounting, which is directly comparable within and between financial firms, this should lead to less reliance being placed on stress testing to determine the exposure to risk of whole enterprises. Particularly significant here is the fact that through risk accounting, we can start with an understanding of an enterprise's inherent risk, that is, its maximum potential for loss. Risk appetite setting and monitoring. One last but very important point is that a firm's risk appetite can be more meaningfully determined in using RUs. Given that the general ledger, management accounting and risk accounting are all tied together, and are drawn from a common source of data, a firm's risk plan in RUs can be produced in exactly the same format as its financial plan, and together they comprise the firm's business plan. It also means that if a firm's risk appetite is set in RUs and reporting is also in RUs, the potential is created for the real-time reporting of excesses over approved risk appetite limits. To summarize, the key features of risk accounting are that it is simple, there is no reliance on complex quantitative modeling techniques, 
The tables and templates are the product of expert input and validation, which means the knowledge and intellect of management and supervisors become embedded in the actual fabric of the risk measurement system. Report production is timely, as calculations of exposure to risk in RUs are performed upon transaction capture in the general ledger and consequently can be reported in real time. Calculations of exposure to risk are representative of the risks actually accepted and perhaps most importantly, the outputs in RUs and the RMIs are aggregatable. They can be validly aggregated by various categories such as organization, risk type, location, customer, product, etc. The outputs are directly comparable within and between financial firms provided standardized tables and templates are applied. And finally, the outputs are auditable. The method uses a standardized measurement-based metric so its outputs are fully auditable. For a detailed description of risk accounting, you can download our research note, Risk Data Aggregation Implementing BCBS 239 from our website www.financialintergroup.com and clicking on Research Papers. Thank you.